Church, please welcome Brother Barry. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Okay. Amen. Well, thank you for that welcome. I, uh, I count your pastor as a friend, and I've gotten to know him a little bit over this last year, and there's two things I know. I know he loves Jesus. Actually, I'll make that three. I know he loves his wife, <laughs> and I know he loves you guys. He loves the body of Christ that God put him in, and, and so uh, you guys are blessed, and I know that he is as well. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, our family. So um, 1997, I uh, was far from God, running as fast as I could the other way, and uh, found out my wife was pregnant with our oldest son, and um, that was a game changer in my life. I, uh, knew who, I, I knew who God was. I knew the truth. I knew everything, but at that point, I turned away from my sin. I turned to Jesus. He saved me, changed our lives. Shortly thereafter, I... Uh, I shared in a church kind of like this my testimony, and as I was going to sit down, the Holy Spirit said, this is what you're going to be doing the rest of your life. And I said, God, you don't know what you're talking about. That's crazy. <laughs> and uh, about a month later, I got the nerve up to tell my wife, and, and she said, I kind of already had a feeling that the guy was working in you, and told my pastor. He said the same thing. And so I ended up going to uh, seminary, and several years later, uh, this guy uh, I met was talking about planting churches in New England. New England's about 3% of the people in, in New England uh, go to church. And so it sounded like a good idea. I came home, told Missy, we're going to go plant churches in uh, New England. She said, you're crazy. And uh, so not too much later, we were in Maine, part of a new church plant. And God was just kind and gracious and good. We're in a little rural community outside of Portland, Maine, a little lake town. And he just did some really cool things. People came to Christ. Uh, people came, you know, got called to ministry. I mean, just really cool stuff. We were able to help some other churches get started. I took a job with the North American Mission Board, kind of overseeing church planting in the state of Maine. And uh, God just had his hand on it. About a year ago, uh, a friend of mine was doing a training for church planters, and he and I together. And as I sat there, every time he got up to talk, the Lord was like, you're going to plant another church. And I'm like, Lord, I'm like 48. I'm 49 now. I'm 48 years old. I, you know, that, that's kind of a young man's game. I'm not sure I'm really, you know, up for that. And, and of course, when God begins that, he, he knows what he's doing. And so we just figured it would be in Maine. That's kind of what we knew. Our kids had grown up there. And we, we came home to North Carolina. I had a meeting with someone, and I just really had a sense we were going to be in North Carolina. And so long story short, I uh, began to just network and connect with people that we knew through the years, and God landed us in this community to be a part of what he's doing. And so we're going to plant the Point Church. We're not part of the Point Church in Raleigh. We're, we're an autonomous church. But this is the vision that God has, has given us, and that's that every man, woman, and child in this community, in, in the Fort Bragg region, would encounter Jesus in word and deed. And so what that does automatically is it says, well, you know what? It's not all about you because we can't accomplish that. Right? One church is not going to accomplish that. And so what this is, is, is it's not a competition to see who can get the 30% of the people in our community who go to church into their church. Because if it was a competition, then we would lose, right? Because we're starting from nothing. But it's not a competition because it's a partnership. As we come together and say, hey, you know what? There's people in our community who haven't encountered Jesus in a vibrant, in a living, in a dynamic way. There's people who need to hear the truth of the gospel, and it takes different churches and different expressions to accomplish that. And so I, wanna, I, want, I, wanna know that, I want you to know that I'm here as a, as a friend and as a cheerleader, as a friend of your pastor, as someone who thanks God that you're here and have been here. How long has this church been here? Anybody? No? Long time. Yes, sir. How many? 71. So 71 years ago, someone had a vision to start a new church in this area to reach the people who lived here, yeah. right? Because every church was a church plant at some point along the way. Praise God. That's what he does. And so you're still here faithfully accomplishing that. And so I want to encourage you in that today. So if you want to open your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 15. I want to pray. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. We come before your throne. And Lord, we come boldly and we come expectantly because your son Jesus made a way. And the only way is through him. And we thank you for that. And we thank you that, that, that your son Jesus is proclaimed in this place. We thank you that so many of the people in this room have come to faith to believe. And so we can come together to call on your name, ask you to speak so that we might respond in faith and that we might be transformed in a way that would empower us as we leave here to be salt and light and to see you work through us in our community so that more people would know you and you would get more glory. We just pray all those things in Jesus' name. Amen. Anything dear to you? I lost a kid one time. That was kind of dear. So John Marie, our youngest son, he's 10 years old. He, he he's, was born in Haiti. When he was four years old, he came home to be with us. We, we adopted him into our family. And just after he came home that year, I tore my Achilles. And, and so I'm not too long after that, I'm in a boot. And I tell my wife, I'm going to take John Marie, we're going to go to the mall. I can't remember exactly what we're doing there. Why would I want to go to the mall? But anyway, so we end up at the mall. John Marie at the time is about four years old. And so we're kind of, you know, I'm, I got my boot on and we're kind of walking through the mall. We come through the food court. There's only one mall in the whole state of Maine, just so you know. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. So, so it's it a nice mall. So, so anyway, we're kicking it through the food court and John Marie breaks away and he just takes off running. Of course, right? Who takes a kid to? And seeing John Marie at the time, he's not speaking real good English. You know, my Creole's pretty broken, you know, and, and he's gone and I can't chase him. If I chase him, you know, I mean, I just, just can't do it. And so I'm just in this place of like panic and despair. I look over to this guy next to me. I have no idea who he is. He says, I said, well, you chase my son, who's a different color than me, right? Chase my son <laughs> down, you know, and get him for me. Okay. And so he takes off. And so that was a moment where I lost something that was very precious to me. You ever lost anything really precious to you? According to the Bible, according to God's word, Jesus himself came to seek and to save that which is lost. And the reason he did that is because his father is passionate about those who are lost. You and I, before we knew Jesus, if you're a follower of Christ, that he was passionate about you. And so what, what the Lord does is he pursues those who are lost. He goes after them faithfully, passionately. In the passage of Scripture we're in, there's two little, little stories right before the one we're reading, one where, where there's a shepherd and one sheep out of a hundred takes off. And guess what that shepherd does? He doesn't stay home with the safe 99 sheep, but he goes after the one. He risks everything to go after the one precious sheep that he loves because he's a shepherd. And he tells this story to the Pharisees, the ones who are self-righteous and have it all figured out. They're religiously superior to everyone and they know it. And then there's this other story that's a woman. And she's got these 10 coins that are really worth something, more, worth more than a sheep. And, and one of those coins gets lost and she's desperate and she's not worried about the nine and she's not sitting there thinking, well, at least I got nine. Nope, she goes after the one, she goes after the one, and as soon as she finds the one, guess what the scripture says? She calls her friends together and they have a party, just like they did when they found that sheep. There was a party, there was a celebration. Because we celebrate that which is important to us. We're thankful for that which is important to us. And so we know from the scripture that God is passionate about that which is lost. People that are far from him that do not know him. And so we're going to dive right into the text. So if you guys, I, I understand you guys stand when we read the word. So let's do that together this morning. In verse 11 in chapter 15 of the book of Luke, and he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to one of the sentenced citizens of the country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is now found. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. So this really breaks down into kind of three parts. The first one deals with the reckless younger brother. He'd ask for his inheritance. How dare he go to his father and ask for that which would normally come to him when his father died. In other words, in a sense, and, and, and when we say, hey, give me you know, your inheritance, we don't understand the disrespect that's going on here. It's like he's saying, Dad, you know what? I don't really care about you. I don't want you. What I want is weird stuff. And so I want you to sell your property and break it down. I want you to give me my part. And his part as the younger brother was one third. And so, so, so what we understand in the parable, the understanding of someone who, who was a Jew and read this or, or, or heard this is that he, they, he sold what he had in order to, or at least part of what he had in order to give him his third. And the Bible says he's off and he goes to, to do whatever he wants to do. And so he... He sells his stuff, um, and he gives it to his son, and his son goes, and it says he lives recklessly, and he squanders everything. It happens quickly. Not many days later, he's in this place where he's, he, everything, he, every, he's absolutely living recklessly. After he spends everything, a famine arises, and he begins to be in need. And so he went, and he hired himself out. And so here's what's happening here. Is this, young, this young man, is, he's lost everything. He's in a difficult situation. He doesn't know what to do. He's been rich his whole life. Everything's been handed to him. And now he's working for someone else who owns pigs. This is a dirty thing. Pigs was something that um, was dirty to the Jew. And, and here he is. He, he's not even eating pork, which is unclean, but he's actually participating in, um, in the feeding of these pigs. And it's dirty and it's nasty and it's lower than anyone could imagine. And so the people who are reading this story, the people who are hearing this story, the Pharisees, they can't imagine anything darker, anything more difficult than this. This man has made his life a mess. He's at the lowest of the low. 
And so he comes to the place where he begins to talk to himself. You ever do that? You ever get to a place in your life where you kind of just begin to talk to yourself? And he comes to this place where he begins to talk to himself. And he says, you know what? Things are really bad. This is worse than I ever imagined, worse than I ever could imagine. And so I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell my dad, Dad, I've messed up. And I don't want to be a son anymore. I don't want you to treat me as a son, but I want you to just treat me as a servant. I want to be one of your hired servants, and I want to eat at the table because the hired servants eat better than I do. And so he begins his journey. It says right in the scripture there, he begins his journey back to his father. He's had a change of mind. His heart has changed. No longer is he rebelling against his father. No longer is he going his own way, right? But he's going back to his father simply to have him received back, not as a son, but as a servant. The same job he has there in, um, in, the, in the pig house, in the pig field. But he goes back to his father as a servant. And so then the next part of our story is the father, the extravagant father. And so there, as he enters into visual contact with home base, where he left, he's, his father sees him before, when he's far away. And the Bible says that his father runs to him. So what, what, do you, what do you see here? See, the father hasn't forgotten about his son, has he? Parents, we understand that, don't we? We ever lose someone who's dear to us, or someone kind of rebels and leaves? And there's the father, and he's at the edge of the property, and there a long ways off, he sees that familiar gate of the son, the son who had rebelled against him, the son who had turned away from him, the son who had disrespected him, the son who had hated everything that he was about. And he runs to him. Jewish men in that culture, the head of the household, they didn't run. He kind of, it was a reckless thing. It was a thing where he wasn't worried about what anybody else thought. He went after his son. He pursued his son. He ran fast after him. And the Bible says that he hugged him and he kissed him. And the son goes right into his prepared speech. And he says, Dad, I've messed up. I've gone my own way and, and, and I messed up and now I'm back. And I'm here, and I just want you to receive me as a hired servant. I want to sit at the servant's table, and I want to receive what you, what you have for, for them. I just, want to, I just want some bread to eat. I'll do whatever I need to do. And what does the father do? He cuts him off. He doesn't even hear the complete what he has to say. But he just says, you know what? You need to go, and, you need to go. and he, he begins to tell the servants, go get the robe. And bring it and put it on my son. The robe was the father's robe. It was the head of the household's robe. It was the best robe in the, on the, whole, uh, in the whole household. He said, go get that robe and put it on him. And get that ring that signifies the family name and put it on him. It represents us. It's the father's ring. It's the best that he had. And he said, go and kill the fattened calf, the very best that we have, the one that we save for the most special of circumstances, the one that has, has been around for a long time. And no one, and it's only for the best. And he calls together all of the people, and they have a celebration, a joyous celebration, a celebration of all celebrations, the greatest celebration that that community had seen. It was a beautiful thing. And then the third part is you have the older son, and he's off in the distance doing what he's supposed to do, right? Right? doing the right thing, and he's, back, he's, he's heading back towards the house, and he hears the, the noise in the distance, and he asks him, so what's going on there? What's going on in the distance? What's, what's, what's all that noise? What's the music? And they, and they tell him. They tell him. Let's read, the, let's read the words they tell him. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And so what's the brother's response? He's angry. He's bitter. He's upset. And so the father comes out to entreat him. Notice the father went to the younger son because he was lost, and the father goes to the older son because he's lost. And he comes out, and the Bible says he entreats him. He begs him. He calls him to come in. And the son just tells him he's angry. The son tells him, hey, you never killed the fattened calf for me, and I've done the good things and the right things all along. 
and he was bitter and he was angry. And, and, and as far as we know, he never came in the party. Two sons, they're both lost, right? One appears to be lost. Everybody knows he's lost. He recognizes he's lost. The other son is just as lost, but he's doing the right thing. Every day he shows up to work. Every day he's, he's there for his father. But that which is in his heart is he's just as far off and just as far from God as his father. And so what I want us to see today as we kind of apply this to our lives is this. God the Father is passionate about the lost, irreligious younger brother, and he's passionate about the lost, religious oldest brother coming to faith in Christ. Because see, here in our parable, in this story, the father represents God. And you have a younger brother that represents someone who's irreligious and goes their own way. And then you have an older brother who is religious and does all the right things, but is just as lost as the younger brother. And this story is for the ages. It was for the Pharisees who stood and opposed Jesus and it's for those of us who have a tendency towards being older brothers in our lives. Some of you, in your life, you're a younger brother. You came from our younger sister. You came from far away from God. You knew you were lost. You knew that you needed Jesus. Anyone have one of those stories? Some of us do. That was my story. Man, I went my own way. I went hard after sin. I was looking for something to fill me. I was looking for something to complete me. And I was looking in every place I could find. And only when I found Christ and he pursued me relentlessly, then that transformed me. But see, here's the deal. Some of your older brothers. You grew up in church. You've been around this. You never kind of went. You're, you never kind of went in this irreligious direction. You've been around the church. You've kind of done the right things. But I want to warn you that this passage warns you that 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 just as dangerous as the road that this younger brother took is the road that the older brother took, though he stayed in proximity to his father. And he did what was apparently good and right. The danger is that you can be near in proximity, but far away from God in reality. So here's what I want you to know. No matter where you are with God, how far you've traveled away from him, or where you've been, you can return to your heavenly father in humility and repentance and be fully received as his son or daughter. No matter how far you ha are or have been, you can humbly come home. So this morning, there's probably someone in here that needs to know that. That no matter where you are, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what sins you've got going on that no one else knows about, how dark you feel, how, how much you feel alienated from God and the things of God, I want you to know that you can come home because your good father, he's waiting out by the fence and he's longing for you to come home. And so you can come on. And you know what? It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what secrets you have. Because here's the deal. The people in this room, as their hearts are connected to God's, when you return, they will celebrate with God. Because this is a necessary celebration. One that must take place because God celebrates what he's passionate about. And so look, here's the deal. The other thing I want us to hit on is this. There's people that don't go to this church, that don't go to any church that are in our community that are far from God. And they're, they, they've left churches like this one in droves, many younger families, and they've gone to go their own way and sow their seed, and they're in trouble. Just like some of us were, right? And so you and I, we can be a part of what God's doing, praying for them, going after them, letting God bring them into our life, being friends with them, walking with them. So I want to encourage you in that. I 
One of the dangers of being a younger brother is this sense that, yeah, God will just forgive me, right? And I can continue on this path. When God genuinely forgives and he genuinely works in our lives, there's repentance that takes place. There's life change that takes place. Now, look, the reality is that sometimes sin builds up in our lives, and, and sometimes repentance isn't something that just happens in an, an instant, but it's something that we continually are turning to God daily, and he transforms us over time. So be patient with your younger brothers and sisters. Love them to Jesus. Entreat them to come in. Call them to repentance and faith. Be bold about it, but be gracious with them. That happened in my life, and it changed my life. I know for some of you it happened in your lives. Next thing I want you to know is no matter where you are, who you are, no matter how good and right your life looks on the outside, you can still find yourself as far from God as the younger brother who is running from God. And most likely, there's someone in this room that this is for you. And most likely, you don't really like me, especially in that moment where I kind of lost it for a second, you know? And so you're able, you're able to, to look and say, hey, yeah, he doesn't have anything to say. But I want you to know this morning that for someone in this room, this is probably for you. You're in proximity. You do all the right things. You're in all the right places. But the truth be known that you're angry and you're bitter and you're far from God. And I want you to know that you're just as far as any drug addict in this community. And I want you to know that the good news is this, is your good father, he comes out of the party. He comes out of the party. Now, he could be in the party with his son, loving on his son, holding his son, <laughs> celebrating, right? Right? But sometimes in our older brotherishness, we're outside complaining and whining, and he's got to come out and entreat us in. Does that make sense? But he's good and kind and gracious, and he loves the religious, and he loves the irreligious. That's our God. And he's faithful. And so maybe this morning he's coming to you, and he's just calling you and saying, come on in the party. Celebrate with your irreligious younger brother. Love on him and be thankful for him. No matter how good and right things look, it's possible that your heart's far from God. Here's something else I want you to know. Jesus, he's the true and better older brother. Amen. You see, he didn't stay at home and do the right thing. But the Bible says that he came to earth, he was born of a virgin, he lived this perfect life, and he was on this rescue mission to seek and to save the lost. There's this story out of Vietnam. A, a uh, brother, the man who's home in the U.S., was missing in action. They couldn't get any information or any word on what, where he was and what was going on. So the brother goes to Vietnam and he just personally goes to look for his brother. And he goes into all these different situations, all these different circumstances, all these different places. He puts himself in harm's way. And over time, people from both sides of the war knew who he was, and they were, he was referred to as the brother, and there was a respect there because he was the brother and he was pursuing his other brother. And see, our God is a good and true older brother. This, the brother in this story, he should have gone to find his brother. He should have gone after him. That's the type of heart that he should have had. But he was worried about what he was doing, and he put him aside, and he put him away. But the heart of God in our, in our hearts should be to go after those. So my question to you is this, this morning. Jesus, who is the true and better elder brother, who came and he lived perfectly and he suffered greatly and he gave his life as a sacrifice so that you and I might have life. After dying on the cross, 
and raising from the dead in victory over sin and death, offering followers that victory. And he ascends to heaven and he pours out his spirit and his Holy Spirit pursues people. How is he pursuing you today? Is he pursuing you as someone who doesn't yet know him? Is he pursuing you as an older brother who, who's kind of got set in your ways? And maybe you're a follower of Christ, but you tend to have judgment. You tend to sit outside of the celebration. You tend to miss some of the best that God has for you because you've just been good. It's crazy enough, as a younger brother, someone who's walked with God for 20 years, I find myself in that place from time to time. I find myself kind of doing the right things, going through the motions. And God has to wake me up and remind me, man, you're just in need. You're in desperate need of my grace, my mercy, my holiness. You're in desperate need of my son. So is Christ pursuing you today? So how do we respond to this message as a people, as the people of God? here in this place. I can think of three ways that followers of Christ respond. Once, the first one is we look up at our father. We look up at our true older brother and we trust them completely in faith at what they've accomplished on our behalf. We worship him. Are you thankful this morning for what Christ has accomplished in your life? Are you thankful this morning that that we can come and sing and praise and that no matter how messy things are, that he is faithful and, and available in our lives? Are you thankful this morning that when you were that younger brother or younger sister, that he pursued you and he sent people into your life and he called you to himself? Amen. So we can come and we can worship. The next thing we can do is we can... We can, we can look at each other. We can look at each other and be reminded that we're sons and daughters of the same family. And so we can love each other and we can be there for each other. Man, it's real easy in the church of Jesus Christ to be in the same church but not genuinely love people who are different from us. Somebody who's an older brother The younger brother can be very judgmental and angry and bitter, right? You can feel those things, pick those things up. You just kind of go do your own thing. But I want you to know that that what Christ has accomplished through the cross is he's leveled the playing field. And those who are irreligious, they come. And those who are religious, they come. And, And when they do, then we're all just children of God, sons and daughters before him. And so we can love one another. We can be there for one another. Who is it in this room today, or maybe that's not in this room, that the Lord's going to put in your mind so that you can go and you can love them as your brother or your sister? Be available to them. Be there for them. Who is it that you sinned against that you need to confess and just let God do his work? Who is it that sinned against you and you need to go and you need to forgive them? Let God tear down those walls that he's torn down through the cross. So we look up and we look in and then we look out. We join our father in celebrating what he celebrates and loving what he loves and pursuing what he pursues. You see, God the son has sent forth his spirit and he is pursuing people that are not yet in Christ right now. He's at work. And he's drawing people. Some of them may be here. Maybe the reason you're here is because he's pursuing you, right? But he's pursuing people that are not yet in Christ. And you and I, as we look out, we can join him in that. As missionaries, right? There's there's a a guy on our our team uh, from the point that was a missionary in Indonesia for years. And his wife, they're faithful. But you know what? There's as, as many, there's lost people here too that need someone to go as a missionary and proclaim the good news and love them where they're at and disciple and train more people to go and to pursue and to be on mission together. Right here where you are. 
One of the coolest things, one of the exciting things is you and I, and you guys already know this, you're living this out, is that you're making disciples. You're seeing people come to faith. You're making disciples. And then the government sends them out to the next place. Right? And so you're sending people as missionaries all over the world to be faithful where God's called them, where he's put them. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing that you've already been involved in. And so just stopping and looking up and looking in at each other and looking out at at, at what God is doing and just being thankful that he's including you in this. It's necessary to celebrate and rejoice with God. It's necessary to be all about what he's about. The end of the story that I began with is that that, that fellow who went after John Marie in the mall, he brought him back. And I was super thankful. Primarily because I knew that Missy was going to kill me if anything happened to him, right? But I'll, I'll tell you something about John Marie. Uh, John Marie was four years old and never had a father. Or he had one, but, but he had died. He didn't know what it was like to have a father. He didn't know what it was like to have a family. He was an angry little dude for a little while. He didn't know. I mean, he couldn't talk to us. We couldn't hardly talk to him. And he would get angry. We had to go to bed at night. Some nights I'd lay down with him, and I'd hold him as tight as I could. And I'd say, um, John Marie, he, I didn't, he probably couldn't understand me. I said, John Marie, I'm your daddy. I'm your father, and I love you. And I'm not going anywhere because I'm here with you, and you're my son. And, and through time, it wasn't me that changed his heart, but it was the love of a family and it was the love of God in and through us that changed our whole family. And so I want you to know that your God, man, he's faithful and he's steadfast and he's pursuing and he's loving. He sent his son, Jesus, for you. And now if you're a follower of Christ, then he's with you and he lives in you through his spirit. And you can go and be a part of what he's doing and see that impact to the end of the earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the hope that we have in him. And we thank you for what you've accomplished on our behalf. And we ask, Lord, that you would empower us by your grace to walk in victory. And I thank you for this church. I pray in the name of Jesus that many more would come to faith, that many more would be baptized, and many more would be sent out in power to be missionaries in the world that we live in. We love you and we praise you. Christ's name. Amen.